There's uh, Soren Kierkegaard, a Danish philosopher, theologian, and here's his sort of mantra from a sermon he wrote, which we'll dwell on today. Eternity is a chamber built for one. It fits one. And um, he might be projecting a little. I think he spent a lot of his time in a chamber built for one at his writing table. Um, though he did like to wander in the streets of Copenhagen and um, I think was sociable in his own way, but would then retreat to his study, his writing desk, and that's where he composed the works by which we remember him today. Let's see if we can figure out what he means by this. Eternity is a chamber built for one. We're going to see a couple of definitions of eternity today, uh, which are trying to get us to stop thinking of eternity as a literal continuation of, of time and a continuation of something like life as we know it. The afterlife is a very literal way of thinking about eternity, where it literally comes after or in succession of life on earth. And the way heaven or paradise is popularly imagined is as a, I mean, maybe we're not bodily there. Maybe we've got some more ethereal body, but philosophers like Kierkegaard, and we'll see Borges in a moment, and John Caputo are trying to get us to think about this central concept, certainly from from Christianity, of eternity. Eternity is where we're headed. I mean, it's what it's all about. We're on our way to eternity. That was the thought that arrested Pascal in his wager. We're headed to eternity. And life is just a blink. Life is, from the perspective of Pascal's wager, life is just a little moment in which you have a place at this betting table where you're going to be wagering on the thing that really counts, right? Eternity is forever, and it massively outweighs life. Eternity is where we're headed. <clears throat> uh, so anyone who, who's thinking... Uh, who's doing anything in the neighborhood of Islamic or Christian theology has, has really got to dwell on this concept and to be a fulfilled Christian, well, I guess you want to get to eternity, <laughs> but to be a fulfilled Christian thinker, you want to get a little bit clear on what what is meant by this thing. I suppose to get to it, you need to have a some sense of where it is you're going, which direction you should be pointing yourself at. Eternity is a chamber built for one. Kierkegaard's idea here is that um, he heaven or eternity is where you're finally alone with yourself, with your soul. But your soul is not a, a fixed little, <clears throat> you know, spiritual atom that, you know, is implanted in you before birth and which will be extracted from you upon death and which hasn't changed. It's more like a black box in an airplane which has been recording all of your activity here on earth. Your soul is the medium which your life has been writing on. And life is a soul-making arena in life. You're making a certain kind of soul by the choices you make, by the people you um, commune with and at the end of it all you got a certain kind of soul and and Kierkegaard's idea is that have, heaven or eternity is just where that soul is now left unchanging and it will be heaven or it will be hell depending on what kind of companion you've made for yourself course your companion will just be you you'll be alone with your soul you are your soul and 
it will be an awful place to be, that little coffin, that chamber, that writing table, um, that meditation cell, <clears throat> if you've made an ugly soul. And um, more to Kierkegaard's emphasis, if you've made a soul which just has not at all trained itself to be alone, if you've, in your choices in life, been pressing in with the crowd, Kierkegaard puts it, if you've been in one way or another, explicitly or implicitly, choosing with the crowd, finding all of your meaning and your confidence in your allegiance with what others are doing. And if you just lose yourself, like when you go on your daily walk through the uh, milling and meandering crowds of Copenhagen, if you just kind of throw yourself into that crowd and um, lose yourself, it's a very individualistic view. And we might challenge Kierkegaard on that, but he, he really he really is a little obsessed with this idea that it's very important to form yourself as an individual and be able to stand alone against the crowd. And as a Christian, which Kierkegaard would certainly consider himself, I mean, maybe above all. Maybe Jesus of Nazareth is, is the uh, model here. He's an interesting case, though, of course. And uh, um, <clears throat> in a sense, he did throw himself in with the crowd. That's part of his signature, too, to move among the masses, the poor huddled masses, and to heal them and to find, you know, to break bread with the poor and the, and the rich. <clears throat> so in a sense, he, in his three-year mission, from what we can tell, really did move into the crowd. And, and um, of course, in, in the ritualization of that person that follows his death in the centuries after, I guess there's been no individual historically who's been so pieced up and spread into the crowd as him. He's, his, his, his body is literally broken apart. Well, not literally. Well, I guess, I guess um, Catholics, Orthodox Catholics would say so, something like literally. Uh, I don't, I don't know. Um, Jesus's body is broken into pieces and we consume it, his blood and his flesh in the communion. Anyway, in, in, in a way, my point is Jesus of Nazareth has been spread into the crowd, into the uh, ecclesia, into the church. Maybe that's what the second incarnation is, just the incarnation of, of the Christ being into a interpersonal network of individuals who collate and cohere into an organism or a unity, which we call the church, as flawed as it is historically. But... He also knew how to be alone. He, he knew how to go into the desert and draw a circle in the ground. If we um, watch the Scorsese movie or read the Kazantzakis depiction of his time in the desert, just moves into the desert where there is no one, no life even. I mean, the desert is not just a little bit outside the village of social warmth. It's beyond life. Right. It's like it's like the Himalayan retreat after you move above the tree line. You're leaving life. <clears throat> and um, so it, it, when you move up the mountain or you move into the desert, it's like you are um, practicing for, for the afterlife where you really have left life. I mean, that's by definition what the afterlife is. It's not life. Whatever else it is, it's not life. Eternity is a chamber bill for one. You're going to be alone, so get ready for practice. Practice being alone. If you've spent all your energy throwing yourself into the crowd, you will not be ready for eternity. You, we're all going to the same place. I, this, this is a very nice... Uh, notice... Hmm. There's a great moment in the movie Contact. Well, in the Carl Sagan book Contact originally, where they're, they've made first contact with an alien civilization and... They're trying to decode this message, this pulse of, it turns out to be prime numbers um, they've received from the star system Vega. And <clears throat> one of the engineers at the sort of SATI site, the satellite reception site on Earth in New Mexico, says, um, 
if we're going to decode this, we've got to think like a super intelligent species. And a super intelligent species would design efficiently. They'd know how to pack a lot of information into a small amount of signal. And if we're thinking like God, if we're asking, what will heaven be like? Well, heaven is, first of all, where you're close to God, where God's design is pure and it hasn't been um, um, corrupted by the world and our um, sinful ends. And <clears throat> if God's got to make sort of two places, God's got to make heaven and hell. If, if the afterlife is partly a place of justice where you get what you deserve, you might think God would be such a good engineer, such a good afterlife engineer. God would know how to solve two tasks with the very same device. That is, God wouldn't need to make two places, one up there and one down below, and one overseen by angels strumming harps and one overseen by demons prodding you um, without cease with pitchforks and dipping you into the fire, God will just make one place. And it will be the, the simplest place possible. It will just be a chamber. <laughs> and there's nothing in it. And everybody gets the same thing. Everybody just gets their own little chamber. It's like a coffin. And um, it will be a perfect heaven and a perfect hell. And God won't need to add anything to it. Or God won't need to provide, pump in a, you know, a soundtrack of horrifying music or pleasant music to alter the experience. You will be alone with yourself and you will make it a heaven or hell. This afterlife will then be perfectly just. God's justice won't be something meted out to you in some sort of trial after your life. The justice will be natural and perfect. It will be a, almost just a, a causal outcome of what you've done. A bit almost impersonal. I mean, that's the way the Indian system thinks about karma philosophically. It's just this almost impersonal force, which is yet perfectly just. Kind of a similar idea here um, in this wonderful poem by Borges, whom we met really on the first day of the course, of heaven and hell. This is translated from Spanish, I guess. Though it, I think he, he did did some of his own translations, so this might be Borges's original wording. I I didn't check the text, but uh, let's let's read through this quote unquote together. In the clear glass of a dream, I have glimpsed the heaven and hell that lie in wait for us. So I am the prophet, and I have seen. O oh, Israel, now listen. When judgment day sounds in the last trumpets and planet and millennium both disintegrate. When space and time both disintegrate. And all at once, O oh time, now I'm speaking to time, all your ephemeral pyramids cease to be wonderful. Ephemeral means lives and dies in a day, like some ephemera in the insect world. Our pyra a pyramid is our symbol of human persistence, of, uh, you know, uh, a lasting monument to human ingenuity, but it crumbles too. It's just relative to eternity like a fruit fly. When all your ephemeral pyramids cease to be, the colors and the lines that trace the past will in the semi-darkness, as the light is going out of the world, form a face. Wonderful image here. I, I imagine as you're dying, as the world is ending, this is really everything dying. This is a judgment day. This is the apocalypse. As, as we're he heading to the final fade out of the movie that was reality, the colors and the lines that made up the historical totality of, of life that traced the past will form a face. You'll realize you have this revelation as we're leaving life that it was all a face. <laughs> it's like if you uh, <clears throat> zoom up from a, you know, in Google Maps and you realize that the, uh, uh, you know, a topography of the GTA forms a face or a message. Forms a face. 
a sleeping face, faithful, still, unchangeable. The face of a loved one, or perhaps your own. And the sheer contemplation of that face, never changing, whole, beyond corruption, will be, for the rejected, an inferno, and for the elected, paradise. So you can see, you know, in the last three lines there, the last two lines really, inferno and paradise, hell and heaven, the rejected, those uh, who didn't pass the test, and the elected, those who did pass the test. And it's the same face. It's like Kierkegaard's chamber. It's not two faces. This is not that the damned will see one horrible face and the good will see an angelic face. You see the same face, and it's a nice face. It maybe is your own face. It's a peaceful face. It's an innocent face. It's a face which has not been corrupted by the world. Somehow this face is the world. It is life, but it's been an uncorrupted by it. It's, it, it's maybe this face is the sleeper who has been dreaming the world. The world has been the dream of the sleeper, and the sleeper is innocent. And you are the sleeper. You're leaving life. You're waking up, and you're having this momentary out-of-body revelation that the whole thing was you, lying on the couch of Brahma, sleeping and dreaming reality. And now this face will represent hell to you or heaven, depending on how you've acted in the world. Because everything you did, you did to yourself. Or everything you did, you did to a loved one. Or everything you did, you did to this innocent being. Right. Well, how did you treat it? all the sacrifices maybe you made in this fallen world to treat others well. Now, as you leave life and you see this face, you realize it wasn't a sacrifice. It was, it was almost you get this selfish reward that it was all to me. It all returns to me. Everything was, was me. So Borges is using truly poetic license here to just tell us what's happening. I mean, he hasn't presented us with a philosophic argument. And I don't know, did Borges, the blind mystic, really see this? And is he just reporting back to us with a little bit of irony? <clears throat> or is he just, did he just have this speculation that this is, this is a cool idea, this would be a cool way to arrange heaven and hell. And so let's put it into a poem instead of a book review. I don't know, but cool idea. And let's, let's um, finish our contemplation of the concept of eternity with this piece of very sophisticated, I guess, 20th century continental theology. John Caputo, very prominent, uh, you know, religious thinker who, who, who draws from the European philosophic tradition to partly to perform a kind of exegesis of Christian concepts like the kingdom or, or eternity. So here, Caputo, it's one of the most challenging readings I think we have in the course, but um, or it's quite different from a lot of the other more analytic readings. But this is analytic in its own way. It's trying to get clear on the meaning of a key concept. The key concept is kingdom, and he's asking as a, as a contemporary sort of Christian thinker, what is, what is this kingdom spoken of in, in the Gospels, in Scripture? Well, it's this place of reversals. It's odd. The kingdom's an odd place. It's where last shall be first, sinners are preferred. Sinners are preferred to the righteous. So <laughs> that's really weird morally. I mean, you might be alongside <clears throat> when the prophet tells you, in the kingdom, the poor shall be uh, uplifted and, and uh, you know, the sick shall be healed. That, that, that would be a kingdom of reversals, but it would be one in which still a kind of moral structure is upheld. You know, the good are rewarded or the innocent are rewarded and protected. And that's opposite to our world, maybe. But here we're told the sinners, I'm not, I'm not, I can't quote you the actual chapter verse here, but the sinners are preferred 
to the righteous. Wow, this is really an odd place, and maybe not quite what we thought heaven is. Strangers, the neighbor, insiders are out. It's it's upside down world, heaven. Or maybe the world is uh, just, I mean, heaven maybe is the reality. It's close to God, and God is the ultimate reality. And the world is maybe just the inverse of it, or the, uh, you know, the inverse concave impression of it. <clears throat> the kingdom of God abides by a certain logic, but it is a divine logic from the point of view of the world, which is its antagonist, its opposite, uh, its competitor. What goes on in the kingdom looks mad and even impossible. Still, it can be said in defense of the kingdom that it's not simply impossible, but rather, let us say, the impossible. We might even speak of the logic of the impossible. Caputo's trying to um, understand the logic of the impossible. But we start with the perfectly logical assumption that with God, all things are possible. Perfectly logical, because God is by definition omnipotent. So that just means God by definition. Logically, it follows God. If God exists, can do anything. So with God, all things are possible. So maybe heaven is where what seems impossible to us is, is, is happening. That's a very, it's a very logical way of thinking about heaven. So we're getting here in Caputo something a little bit more like philosophy than say in Borges. And maybe even in the Kierkegaard, though Kierkegaard's a canonical philosopher. Um, in the bit of Kierkegaard we, we've encountered, and I'm not sure if he's giving much in the way of explicit argument. Caputo's trying to make a nod to that here by saying, just starting with the concept of God, if you had to infer what the afterlife would be like or the kingdom of God would be like, well, it might be where the impossible is made possible. The way things are counted in the kingdom confounds the calculations of the world. If your brother offends you seven times a day, you should forgive him. And that still holds, even if he offends you seven times 70, which seems excessive. Uh, okay, here's the most impossible thing about the afterlife. Maybe it's here. Maybe the kingdom is around you or within you. Wouldn't, I mean, that would be the great. So you might, you might be sold on Caputo's idea. You might say, okay, I get it. Yeah, that makes sense. The afterlife will be a place where the impossible is possible. And then Caputo says, aha, I got you. Wouldn't the most impossible most surprising and wonder, wonderful impossibility be that it's already here and you just haven't seen it or noticed it yet. So the, the kingdom is not out there or after life. Maybe the kingdom is just what you realize is here already when you act in accordance with it. When you, it's not that you do good by giving to your brother and forgiving your brother, and then God will reward you when you die. It's that God's way is the way of the impossible. It's the way of omnipotence, and it's the way of fearlessness. And when you start acting that way, you are closer to God. And if you're closer to God, you're closer to heaven. And again, that doesn't just mean you're getting more points, more brownie points, um, to get your final scout badge. Um, and let's take a trip eastward uh, to the Himalayan region and switch traditions. Here we're uh, firmly within the Buddhist tradition. This is from Shanti Deva's classic Buddhist text. It seems to be some kind of monk manual. He, he wrote it, spoke it, or composed it in some way while he was at uh, Nalanda University, which was a kind of, I mean, Buddhist monastery. Uh, filled with men devoted to a life of study and meditative absorption. The Buddhist tradition is obviously, in many respects, very different from the, uh, you know, the Judeo-Christian Islamic theistic tradition, which is what we're within when we're talking about 
the afterlife in terms of an eternal paradise of some kind. Um, even if in Kierkegaard that eternity might be a kind of metaphor. But there's an important similarity I, I want you to notice between Buddhism and Hinduism and Christianity and Islam and Judaism and I mean Sikhism and I mean what are called the major global faith traditions which you know if you survey the world comprise the the overwhelming majority of human religiosity today and these are all religions which kind of took over in the last couple of thousand years or last three thousand years let's say um, Hinduism and Judaism and Jainism being older than Islam say but what these traditions have in common is a belief that where we are right now the situation we're in right now the form of life we have right now is fallen from a prior better state and the point of life uh, is to get us back to where we belong get us back to god we came from god and we're fallen now and alienated from our true source from the good and we got to get back to it in hinduism and buddhism um the return is sometimes to, sometimes to something conceived to be much more impersonal a kind of force or in buddhism it's taken to a very dramatic maybe natural end point where this force is really characterized as a kind of absence it's a kind of nothingness when we talked about the holy and the approach of the mysterium at the beginning of the course remember it's mysterium is first of all um different from the ordinary right it's a negative attribution in the sense that you're you're not saying anything specific or qualitative about it you're really saying that we lack information about it in buddhism the the thing we return to when we attain enlightenment is often conceived as a kind of you know, just absence of all the things we're familiar with and the world uh, of illusion samsara in buddhism is is the place of qualitative obstructions illusion is just the conjunction of qualities um, which come to us through perception and um, enlightenment is the process of clearing all that away it's like a kind of noise and what remains when all that is cleared away is good it's good to get there nirvana is where you want to be but nirvana is maybe most accurately characterized as just an absence of all that clutter and noise and uh, so we've got this kind of different picture of quote unquote Buddhist heaven but the, the, the term Buddhist heaven is not that um, disrespectful or distorting I think obviously the term heaven has very heavily Christian connotations but again Christianity and and Buddhism are similar in that they accept that we're trying to get somewhere very different from from the world we know now <coughs> this this view is so pervasive in most of what we identify as religion today that it's hard to imagine what else religion can be i think the very term religion if you look it up has this connotation in latin of uh, reconnecting us with our roots that lig in religion might might be cognate with our word ligament a connector uh, you can you can check me on that but 
Anyway, we have here a text from Shanti Deva. He was a monk, scholar, poet, uh, student. I don't think we know all that much about, apart from his having written this work and at least one other. I think this is the most widely read of his. And as I said, it seems to be a kind of manual for monks. And I think it's important to keep that context in mind as you read it. Buddhism is a very extreme religion, and I think a Buddhist would agree to that. Buddha was a very extreme individual. He pursued a path to its end. And um, in Buddhism, the monk is really the true Buddhist. I mean, Buddhism is, I think, more than any other religion, a almost intrinsically monastic religion that to, to be a true Buddhist is really to become something like a monk. Um, it's to renounce all of the things of the world that make up life as we know it, not just the pleasures, but all the attachments, like the attachments to family, attachments which seem very noble and good, and att attachments of love to particular people, of mother for child and uh, for projects you have, like if you're very attached to some kind of um, you know, environmental project, you're trying to save the world by, that too is a kind of attachment which might be preventing you from enlightenment or nirvana in Buddhism. And so, I mean, the monk is an extreme character. The monk is someone who's really, I mean, they've shaved their head and they've given away all of their possessions and renounced all of their connections to friend and family and left the world, they've gone up a mountain to live in this kind of limbo state between world and nirvana. And that's hard. I mean, assumedly, Shanti Deva is speaking to a lot of young men who've maybe recently taken their monastic vows. And so th there are a lot of passages like this one and the next one we'll look at where Shanti Deva is doing a kind of propaganda against the body. He's trying to make the body and life seem as uh, unsettling and disgusting as possible. Uh, maybe because life is truly disgusting if you see it clearly with the monk's cleansed eye, but also, as I said, propaganda implying a little bit of spin or imbalance, but uh, propaganda can be for a good purpose too. It might be that to keep these young monks in line with the vow they have taken, you need to, at least in the early years, make the body and its pleasures seem especially disgusting so the monk can feel confident in the decision they've made, right? Um, so here's a, a really wonderful little piece of propaganda against the village. The village is, most of these guys would have come to come from what we would identify as villages, sort of that scale of human settlement. Uh, you can substitute for village, Mississauga, or wherever it is your people gather and shop and um, enjoy life. It's um, the human gathering. The village is where humans gather and live and go about their business and seek their pleasures and, and bereave their losses. Here, the focus is on the delight of the village, like the flash and pop and buzz of, uh, you know, Young and Dundas Square, whatever. Shanti Deva does not know the word 
zombie, which I think is, isn't that a voodoo concept? But you can see he's saying the village is a zombie apocalypse. The village really is a place of zombies or moving corpses. Zombies are bodies which actually lack life but have been animated somehow. And Shanti Deva is saying, look at the village and notice that every villager walking in the sunshine and whistling and going about their business is actually a kind of zombie. That is, corpse just means body. <clears throat> You are a moving corpse. So you're a zombie. Life is zombiehood. And when you see the corpses unmoving in the, this is the charnel ground, I guess this is where they would have been performing the cremations of the recently deceased. And we walk by that and for a moment there's gloom, there's a cloud that covers up the sun of our life and we are reminded of death and where all life goes and we're upset and we're horrified by these unmoving bodies. Well, Shanti Davis says, shouldn't you be more upset at the moving bodies? Isn't a zombie more horrifying than a corpse? <laughs> Why would you... Okay, I mean, this is a really weird idea, an extreme idea. If bodily existence is a kind of limitation, if the body is what is limiting you from your fuller, freer existence, if the body is relative to the freedom you could have, the spiritual freedom you could have, if the body's a kind of prison, it's becoming a little bit corpse-like. Corpse is something that tends to rot, to degrade. That's partly what's upsetting and disgusting about it. Well, the living body is something which tends to degrade and rot too. And while we're young and on sort of the upside of life, there's a lot of regeneration going on constantly. And the regeneration is holding off the, the natural entropy which, nat which, which eventually takes hold and results in aging and death. So the body is this thing which by its nature is always degenerating and that makes it quite corpse-like too. The body is a sinking ship and if you're, if you're all bound up with it, you're going down with it. And so once you see What's horrifying about this, the body in the burial or burning ground. And then you see what's extra horrifying about the moving corpses of the happy village. Then you should be especially horrified when you look at yourself and realize that you're, you're a zombie too. Isn't that the most horrific revelation of the horror movie that you are that thing. You are the monster. Seen this pile of meat being devoured by vultures and other scavengers is what is food for others to be worshipped with garlands, sandalwood, scent, and jewelry, the worship of the body. How much of contemporary life, of life in the village, has always been body worship, a kind of pagan celebration of the body and its pleasures seems like we turn even our holy days into celebrations of the body and its extensions i mean christmas it's not just the commercialization of it that seems anti-religious it's that what we're buying <laughs> for most of those presents have to do with worshiping the body with garlands sandalwood scent and jewelry uh, well, maybe it's a toaster oven, 
you got for Christmas. Well, that's, you know, to help you feed yourself in a pleasing way. Again, it's about servicing the body and its needs. So the first part of the Buddhist monastic journey is getting you to see you're in a terrible situation, right? That's the first axiom of Buddhism that uh, life, first so-called first noble truth is uh, life is suffering. Sorry about that. Um, just scratching my finger on my laptop touch screen here, but um, so the first the first step toward enlightenment is realizing you're very far from enlightened, that you're in a kind of suffering. People, uh, part of the illusion of life is that it's hard to see that it's filled with this kind of suffering or at least um, dissatisfaction. And uh, so this is, I think of Shantideva here giving a kind of pep talk, partly to himself and partly to um, his audience, whoever that might be. Sent it out by the trappers the defilements, you have walked into the trap of birth. Do you not realize even now that you have entered the mouth of death? Um, the trap of birth, you walked into it. This is a reincarnational system. Your soul uh, has a span much longer than your individual life or your current incarnation. And your current incarnation is the result of past choices your soul or self has made over its previous incarnations. And if you've been born, that is evidence you've already made a kind of error, right? When you've become enlightened, you shall not be born again. Birth in Buddhism is evidence of um, error. And you've been tempted life has laid a trap for you and sucked your soul into it the 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 mouth of death is i mean you got to think of that as this is the vaginal canal and um in a way it's that through which you enter life but it's also a tunnel who's which is just this one way um drawing unto death. Once you've entered that birth canal, once your soul enters the birth canal and then comes out into our world, you're, you're actually just in this one way um, track towards death, right? Life is a great field of temptations. The world is just this place which draws consciousness into it and limits consciousness. Your soul is free consciousness and the world is just a structure of, it's like a big carnival. I mean, literally, carnival is the celebration of the body or the flesh, right? That's the carn in carnival, that's the carn in incarnation. To incarnate is to take on a body. That's the carn in carnivore, too. And you're the meat in the flesh festival. You enjoy the flesh, but you are meat, rotting meat all along. 
here you're compared to a buffalo at the butcher. You can imagine Shantideva has just, he's observed this in his life, seen animals um, penned outside the very small scale slaughterhouse and He's, he's found a couple of them very placidly um, accepting or unaware of what awaits them after their mates are slaughtered and pulled apart. And you're like that. You might, you might find it strange that the buffalo is sitting and dozing in the sun when violent death is maybe minutes away. And Shanti Deva is saying, yeah, that is strange. And that's exactly what you're doing your whole life. The butcher is just, however you will end up dying. And you see your mates go one by one. Your mates are just anyone uh, contemporary with you or on earth at the same time as you. Okay. So you can sense the, what drives the Buddhist quest of enlightenment, it's this unease, extreme unease, which prevents you from eating and sleeping and making love when you realize what awaits you. And in a way, what is with you all along? It's not that just, it's not just that death shall happen to you. It's that you're already dead. You're already a kind of zombie. You're in a world of death when you're in the world of flesh. Um, again, the reincarnational philosophy coming through here. If I do not behave skillfully now when I've attained not just human form, but I've, I've somehow in my past lives been wise and strong enough to get myself into the body of a Buddhist monk. I, I, I'm, I'm not just a human who's in principle capable of achieving enlightenment, but I'm here I am at Nalanda University slash monastery and now's the time. Uh, who knows how many millions of lives and years I've spent in the lower realms. And so if even now I'm not capable with the knowledge I have now of doing what it takes to achieve enlightenment and give up the world of flesh, uh, I have no chance when I'm sent back. There's a bit of a warning here. It's not hell. You won't go to hell. But if, if you don't use your incarnation carefully now, um, you're just going to be pulled back into the world you emerged from into a world where you suffer the cycle of birth and death, but there's no prospect for um, release from that. Uh, so I don't think there's any kind of eternal hell implied here, but there's a long chain of birth and death you can fall into where you're very far from any glimmer of light. And so the Buddhists think of I mean, the, the, the human form being very special. It's the maybe the one form. This is common with Hinduism too. I think it's the, it's the one form where you have the possibility of attaining moksha, liberation, or uh, enlightenment. And if you find yourself drawn to the Buddhist monastery, well, you're very rare and you better use this opportunity um, the ticking clock of the years and the decades you have now to make this push towards enlightenment. Certainly don't fall back. Keep climbing. You're close to the summit of Mount Everest. Pep talk. 
coach speaking to the team in the locker room before the game. How is it you're enslaved by these qualities which are not brave or wise? It's, it's like greed. It's the, these are your enemies. These, I mean, you are your enemy. It's these uh, qualities you have, these patterns of behavior that are your true enemy that prevent you from enlightenment. It's not somebody else that's preventing you from enlightenment. It's an internal battle. You can see in Buddhism, I think Buddha, Siddhartha Gautama, came from a kind of warrior ruler clan. He wasn't a Brahmin. He wasn't from a lineage of teachers or priests. And you can see in Buddhism this internalizing of the warrior ethic. You're still a warrior, but now you've directed inward all of that martial energy and the enemies are within and victory is not on the field of external battle. It's, it's this internal uh, liberating of the self. So snap out of it pick yourself up, pull your socks up, stand up straight, and notice that your enemy is actually worthless. Your enemy is lacking a lot of the qualities you have. And so shame on you, especially if you're letting it defeat you. Uh, I won't read through all of these, but there's this ethic which emerges in Shanti Deva's view and I, I guess this would be very common <clears throat> Buddhist way of grounding our interpersonal relations and motivating ethical action in this case dispelling the suffering of others you have this kind of duty to help others, which is what Shanti Deva maybe is doing with this very text. Why did he write this book? Well, to help dispel the suffering of others. Let's say Shanti Deva himself is enlightened. He's freed himself. I, I don't know if he thought of himself this way, but he felt he had learned enough about the path to now share with others who may be a little bit further back. He's leaving these signposts on the path in these stanzas of his poem so as they're walking down the path they can see someone else has walked this path and is saying keep going and watch out for the uh you know the hyena up ahead but there is a possible <clears throat> contradiction in Buddhism, or at least this, um, you know, this tension. On the one hand, you're supposed to liberate yourself from all attachment to the world and its concerns. On the other hand, there's this profound ethical drive, obligation to help others, to dispel the suffering of others. And you might think, I mean, think very radically, well, if I'm truly liberated from at all attachments, I'll be liberated from the attachment of helping others too. Like uh, enlightenment is sort of the state of not caring about all these things anymore. So why would the enlightened person be helping others? It's got, the, the Buddhist answer has to be something like, as far as I can see, and I'm no Buddhist scholar, but, uh, uh, my sense is the answer would have to be something like, actually, there there is one thing you should care about and should be very attached to, which is achieving enlightenment. And uh, you you so it's 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 not the elimination of all attachment that is sought in Buddhism. It's the elimination of all 
the lower attachments. And there's one thing you should, I mean, you might not call it attachment at that point. It maybe deserves a better name, but you're very uh, devoted and, um, you know, um, obligated to this ethical dispelling of the suffering of others. It's the idea that it's the bodhisattva vow of achieving liberation yourself and then going back to help the others across the great ocean, right? You've made it to the other side, the paradise island of Nirvana. And I guess you could just hang out there for eternity, but um, maybe you've got the obligation or you'll have just the natural inclination to go dive back in and help pull others across. And as you become detached from your own personal cravings and your own, you know, egoistic attachments, it might be that it just becomes very clear how, why you should help others. Their suffering is just like my own. I should help others too because of their nature as beings, which is like my own being. When happiness is liked by me and others equally, what is so special about me that I strive after happiness only for myself? See, Shanti Deva here is saying it's illogical to not help others and to look after only yourself. Egoism is illogical. There's a kind of uh, hypocrisy or self-contradiction, I mean, of a logical kind um, in egoism. Your suffering is not really that special. I mean, everybody's life is unique. You know, the way I feel when uh, a loved one dies is qualitatively got its own, you know, fingerprint on it. It's, it's, it's not quite like the way you feel when your loved one dies, but there's quite a bit in common. And, Ethically, what matters is that it feels bad. You know, it feels bad to me and to you. And if it's a roughly equal level of intensity of badness, you know, um, what's so special about mine that I should, you know, be obsessed with my suffering and not yours? 